Denali leaned against the handbar, sick with fear. I'm sorry I threw the spear. I thought if I could hit the wolf I could save Nikki. He wondered where the rest of the wolf pack was. He had the spear back now and wouldn't make the mistake of letting it go again. The dog was already dead Kumar said. Its neck snapped when the wolf tore it from the harness. Kumar slumped back but kept the hunting knife ready in his hand. Those are really big wolves he muttered. An excited howl split the air behind them. Denali looked back in time to see a half dozen wolves tear into the carcass of the dead one, feasting with sickening slurps and crunches. Hike Denali yelled at the dogs. They picked up speed. He hoped the wolves behind him would eat their fill from their fallen pack member and let Denali go. You all right Kumar asked. I'm fine. Denali was shaken but not hurt too bad. The sled went over a bump, and the hatchling dragon dug its claws into Kumar's legs to keep from being tossed off the sled. Ouch! Kumar kicked at the dragon with his good leg. The hatchling flapped up and landed square on Kumar's chest. Its long tongue flicked out and licked the swollen back of Kumar's head. Kumar grunted in annoyance and let the dragon lick the wound. When it had finished, it gazed at Denali with its big eyes. Its dragonstone glowed softly in contentment. It hoped Denali would let it stay with him if it tried to be useful. Denali stroked the dragon's sleek face. She was so beautiful. So delicate, like frost crystals on frozen water. All right Frost. You can stay Denali said. Frost sounded like the perfect name for the baby white dragon. Frost let out a happy purr. Not on my chest you can't. Kumar shoved the baby dragon off his chest back onto his feet. This is the craziest thing I've ever done he muttered. Who'd have thought the greatest dragon hunter alive would ride in a sled with a great white dragon hatchling. He shook his head in amazement. I think she likes you Denali said. Kumar grimaced. I have a feeling that's not the whole pack back there. Denali shook his head. It would be a small one if it was. Then we can expect more trouble. Kumar leaned back and closed his eyes. His face was too pale. The fight with the wolf had taken all the strength he had left. Let's hope not Denali whispered. But he knew his father was right. They still had a long way to go to reach Alulasad. The rest of the tribe had left them far behind and had probably already arrived. Kanver and Dar Anad Har flew over a moon-shaped bay. The Varnan colony of Alulasat spread beside the freezing water. Dar Anad Har landed out at the headland where no one would see him. Shivering, Kanver slid to the rocky ground. His frozen feet and legs refused to hold him for a moment. He almost fell, but steadied himself and grinned. Dar let out a worried growl. I'd fly you right into the center of town if I could, but I'm sure the humans wouldn't take it well. Can you walk? Of course I can walk. I just need a moment to get my blood flowing again Canver said. I don't know Dar grumbled. I think I better fly you a bit closer. The ground looks slippery. You worry too much Dar. Canver checked to make sure his crossbow and bolts were still secure on his back and his hunting knife in the sheath at his waist. A bit of a walk is just what I need to get my blood flowing again. I'll buy some warmer clothes as soon as I get into town. Do you have enough money? Canver laughed. No matter how many times Canver had explained the value of each of the coins Dar and Adar had amassed, he never seemed to catch on to what the little round gold things were really worth. Lucky for Canver, Dar had taken the pretty things back to his cave whenever he'd come across them. It's plenty. Believe me Canver said. He took a deep breath, bid Dar on and Har goodbye, and limped toward town. The tide had just gone out leaving a swath of black pebbles he could follow around to the colony. Better that than trying to cross the snowy patches further up on shore. Behind him, Dar grumbled, I'm hungry, why do you suppose all those extra little fat critters were on the coast of Kundiland instead of here where they belong? What I wouldn't give for just a few more tasty sea lions. Canver shivered and hurried as fast as he could, which was never very fast, toward Alulasad. At least it wasn't as cold on the ground as it had been in the air with the frozen wind tearing his breath away. Normally he loved flying with Dar on and Har, but the farther north they'd come, the more excruciating the experience had been. When he reached town, Canver limped away from the water's edge toward the buildings and people gathered there. As he left the rocks behind, he stepped onto snow, lost his footing, and almost fell. He took another step and slipped again. A pair of Varnan men laughed at him. Poor little crippled boy. Go back to Daro. Alulasad is only for real men they taunted him. Canver glared at them. He'd never had to walk on snow and ice before. Dar was right, the ground was slippery. Canver felt like he had when he'd been young and it had taken him so much longer to learn to walk than other children. Years longer, but it hadn't stopped him from trying. And it wouldn't stop him now. He tried to take another step and nearly ended up on his backside. 
The Varnans laughed harder. As Canver was steadying himself yet again, a man wearing thick fur clothes and carrying a spear came over to him. The old man's wrinkled face peered out from the furry hood. Southerners. The man spat in the direction of the Varnans, flipped the spear over so it was point down, and held it out to Canver. The Varnans snorted and walked away. Canver took the spear in his numb hand and used it to steady himself on the slippery ground. Did you come on the Varnan boat? The old man asked. Canver nodded. Well, he couldn't admit he'd flown in on a great blue dragon, could he? You can't go around dressed like that here. The old man's voice was gruff but kind. I know Canver said. His teeth chattered. He hadn't been warm for a couple of days. I just need to buy some warm clothes. Could you point out the closest store? You don't want a southerner store the man said. They don't know how to dress either. You need real clothes. Come with me. The old man led Canver to the edge of town where a group of people had set about constructing some kind of shelters made from whale bones and skins. Using the spear to steady himself, Canver limped after the old man. What's your name he asked as he struggled to keep up. Kopik the old man called back. He reached a beautiful woman who was working on a shelter and whispered something to her. She looked over at Canver. Canver stopped moving. People always stared at him for an uncomfortable amount of time when they first saw him. It took that long for someone to wrap their mind around his twisted left leg and stumpy right arm with its withered two fingers and thumb that served for a hand. Finally she looked away, muttered something unintelligible to Kopik, and went to a bundle next to her shelter. While she searched for something warm to sell Canver, several men of the tribe gathered around Kopik. They were agitated. Upset. Hungry. Canver picked up the overwhelming need for food from everyone around him. They'd come to Ilulasat, hoping the southerners would have food to spare, but the tribe had very little it could give in trade for the food. Canver shook his head and built a shield to protect his mind from their hunger. It was bad enough with Dar on Adhar's stomach grumbling in the back of his thoughts. Akka, how are your eyes Kopik asked one of the other men. Akka blinked and looked around. Better, I can see light and shadow now instead of just blackness. Good. Let's hope for a complete recovery. Kopik slapped Akka's shoulder and then went back to the woman. Do you have it, Eska? Eska pulled a silver fur coat from the bundle. Her shoulders shook, and Canva realized she was crying. Her grief threatened to drown him. He cut his mind off completely from everyone and took a step back. A big man with sharp eyes noticed Canver flinch away. He sneered at Canver. That's right southerner. Get lost. Your people are nothing but trouble. We always had plenty to eat before you came here. Kardik, leave the boy alone Kopik snapped. We need his money to buy food. You should be grateful I found someone to sell furs to already. We might just eat tonight if you don't ruin it. Canver wondered how much it would take to feed so many people and if he had enough. He walked over to Kopik. Are you the Tunit tribe? Canver didn't know how many tribes existed in the Great North. Kopik's eyebrows pressed together. Possibly. Say it again? Feeling foolish, Canver repeated himself. The Tunit tribe? Yes, Kopik said. I think that is how you southerners pronounce it. We say to it though. Canver mimicked the pronunciation. That's closer, Kopik said. How do you know of us? Eska carried the silver coat over to Canver and handed it to him along with a pair of matching mittens and boots. Put them on she said. Canver drew on the coat and mittens. The left mitten didn't fit his crippled hand well, but it was warm, and he was thankful for that. He slipped the furry boots over his dragon scale ones. Bundled in the new clothes, Canver felt heat returning to his body. Eska pulled Kopik aside and whispered to him. Canver lowered the shields around his mind a bit to catch what she said. It's Denali's long coat Eska said. I made it for his 12th birthday. Kopik, if we sell it to this southerner, I won't have anything to give him. Eska Kopik said. You know Denali is dead. It will do you no good to keep the coat. No Eska said. Don't talk like that. He's alive. I know it. Kumar said he'd meet us here, and he'll do it. You wait and see. He's a strong man and he won't let any harm come to Denali. Kopik shook his head. They're dead Eska. No one could survive that dragon. And if they had escaped it somehow, they would have caught up to us by now. We waited long enough for them. They didn't come, because they can't come. The dragon froze them solid, and all you're hoping won't change that fact. You have to come to terms with their deaths. Eska pushed Kopik away, and stalked back over to her shelter. Canver stood frozen to the core. He couldn't move. He couldn't think. He'd tried so hard to get here in time to save his grandfather. Now it sounded like he may have come too late. 